Hey everyone, Wanderbot here, and welcome to Road Warden. I'm gonna use this voice, I think, because it's a good narrator voice. So this game is an illustrated, sort of roguelike, uh, narrative, choose-your-own-adventure game. Uh, most of it is told via text, but they have images on the side, little illustrations, to show what's going on. Normally I don't touch much for pure text-based games, but those illustrations look gorgeous, and I like the sepia tone. I'm gonna turn narration speed up, ambient, don't care. I don't know, I just wanted to see the settings. Oh, dev support. Ooh. That's interesting. I'm curious about the narration. And basic fonts, perfect. Describe attitudes. Interesting. I'm curious to see how that's going to look, but for now, everyone knows to stay away from the wilderness. Most people would never risk a lonely journey. Road wardens not only accept the struggle, they embrace it. They deliver messages, assist merchants, burn human corpses, and if possible, Get rid of the beasts and highwaymen. They live on the road, die young, or retire early. It's a dangerous job, but a respectable one. And it pays well. I leave the safety of the city walls. Select a difficulty mode. Hey, cool. Casual. Focused on story. No time limit. More cash at the start. Some quests are more forgiving. For those familiar with RPGs, 40 day time limit, regular rule set, and then restrictive. I'm going to be honest, I'm going to go casual for this one just because time limits stress me out uh, and can't be altered later on. I'm just going to filthy casual my way through because I think I'm here for the story. There are games that I play for gameplay and there are games that I play for story and this, this feels like a story thing. The wall is still standing, there are no wolves around, no stench of, stench of blood, good signs. This should be the place you're looking for, you're supposed to meet with a group of soldiers but you hear no voices, no sounds of labor. The gate is ajar, but the camp isn't safe. It may keep away the goblins and pebblers, but not beast folk nor trolls, and the night is near. Your palfrey breathes heavily. It's had a long day. I dismount and sneak to the gate and peek inside. Your heavy boots hit the ground, and the pain of a long ride finally catches up with you. You stretch out, bringing your, bringing your backs and legs comfort. Backs. <laughs> Probably back and legs. All you want now is a table, a decent chair, a nice mug of beer, and some warm stew. With any luck, your axe won't be needed here. Take care of yourself. If you're hurt or exhausted, some actions won't be available to you. The weaker you are, the higher chance you'll die in combat. I approach the gate slowly. Oh, I can also just save. Well, that's kind of nice, but it's a quick save. If it's a military camp, it doesn't look the part. Plenty of wasted space. The fire pit is cold. Two people are sitting at the table, tired and disheartened. They're looking in different directions, paying no attention to one another. One of them is holding a cup. After a moment, you notice the quiet humming. You recognize the melody of a lighthearted drinking song from the city harbor. Two people. Uh, it's highlighted as though I can do something with that. They don't look like much of a threat. I can enter. It takes a few breaths to for them to glance in your direction. The first person greets you with a wave of his hand. There are bags under his eyes. His beard is messy. Despite his simple shirt, he's wearing durable, decent boots. A mace with a head covered in iron hangs at his side, but he doesn't reach for it. Take a look at the second soul. Just like you, she's wearing a gambeson, but hers is a bit loose, as if she took it from a corpse. Her head is shaven, as if she's protecting herself from flesh-eating bugs. Her eyes are weary, yet kind. She smiles. Considering the squad was sent here half a year ago, these two surely look the part. Though there should be more of them. Eight, you believe. Let them speak first. It's nice to see an unharmed traveler in this godforsaken shithole. Makes me a tiny bit hopeful. The bearded man's voice is strong and timid. You'll be staying the night with us, I guess. We're soldiers, he and I, adds the armored woman. Her... M her moment? Her moment switches from half asleep to relaxed. We'll do our best to keep the camp safe, but if you were to take the first watch, I wouldn't. it would be a huge help. Travelers ought to help each other, wouldn't you say? You think for a moment. To fully rest, you need a good sleep. Sure, leave it to me. Fantastic. She rubs her hands together. I don't remember the last time I had more than half a night's sleep. The hours before midnight should be the calmest. Just wake, wake us up if anything happens. The man flashes you a wide smile. It's easy to wake us up. Just yell. He drinks from his mug. Ask them about their lieutenant. You wonder how to phrase your question. Oh, this is interesting. I'm going to take a quick bit, uh, just for a, a talking point, specifically to thank 
uh, the developers Moral Anxiety Studio and Assemble Entertainment for sponsoring this video. It was kind of a last minute thing mid-vacation. I get an email from them being like, Hey, you want to cover this game? And I'm like, uh, I can barely fit this in, but yes, because it's one of those games that I've really been looking forward to for a while. I just wanted to dive into this a little bit before I talked about that. Is there anything else really? No, not too much. It's out on PC and it's 11 bucks, which for the quality and depth of story I believe that this game presents, I think is more than worth it. I'm a huge fan of uh, some other narrative, uh, choose your own adventure narrative games that have come out over the last couple of years and this one seems like it's going to be, uh, you know, one of the better ones. And so I'm looking forward to getting further in. I like it. It very much has that feeling of a CRPG, but I don't have to wander around too much. Well, I do, but it's not less time is spent on, you know, actual video game based mechanical travel. And so I can get to the, you know, the meat of it. So how to phrase your question about the lieutenant friendly, playful, dis distanced, intimidating or vulnerable. Uh, let's do friendly. So whenever you meet new people, you can influence how they perceive you by selecting one of the attitudes. I was hoping to meet with your lieutenant. Could we talk for a bit? The woman lets out a loud sigh, dusts off her gambeson, and steps towards you. She pays little attention to the sword at her side. We most definitely can, you and I, though holding this rank is still somewhat new to me. Are you a messenger? Did you lose your mount? She observes you with curiosity. Are you looking for help? I'm your new road warden. My horse is waiting outside. Really? The, shoulder the soldier in the shirt leans forward. That explains how you got here in one piece all by yourself. Better bring your beast here as lieutenant. We have no hay, but I bet, dream, bet it dreams of dropping its saddle. Long pause. I'm Tulia, by the way. She reach, reaches out her hand. It may be a trap. I gesture for her to stop, pretending to be embarrassed. I should wash myself first. Now. I shake her hand. I'm... How do people call you? Lido. Oh, nice. That's a good name. Uh, either uh, Lido Atreides or Lido from uh, Dragon Warrior, both of which are great. And honestly, like fairly fantastic names. Anyway, what should people call you, dude? Your grasp is confident. The shake is slight. Just keep your horse away from the tents. We don't need to smell its dung. Oh, there's one issue. The soldier in the shirt also rises to his feet. We have no tent to spare. You'll have to use a blanket or something. No problem. I enjoy observing the stars. You walk through the gate, your mount looks around, and snorts anxiously. Not many humans could ride a horse. It's not only taller than you, but also bulky. As heavy as it is strong. You can get in the saddle with a single breath, but most people wouldn't know where to even begin. From every side, it's a wall of flesh. Horses were brought to the Dragonwoods from the Conquest in the south. They can trot for a long time, but won't outrun some of the local monsters. Your palfrey needs you to survive, but without it, you too would be lost. my only companion here. I want it to feel at ease. It takes a few steps towards you, towards you, scolding you with another snort. You scratch the bottom of its neck with strength and confidence, just the way it likes it. Humans see useful animals and even pets as monsters in disguise. Getting emotionally attached to them is believed to lead humans to their doom. But you know that horses need companionship. I speak to it gently and lead it to the camp. You end up next to the fire pit. Removing the saddle makes the horse nicker with relief. Take a couple of minutes to examine his back, just in case. While riding, while riding equipment is not that heavy for such a strong animal, with enough time it starts to chafe. We should add something better to eat than shabby grass. You should look for an inn. I need to unpack. You haven't brought that many things, and lost one of the sacks while fleeing the crimson corpse eaters. Worst of all, you have no rope left. But maybe the soldiers could, uh, could share one. It shouldn't cost more than a dragon bone. Aside from the travel set, you own a few valuable possessions, essential for your trade. Interesting, so I can be a f fighter, a mage, or a scholar? Well, that's interesting. Scholar has writing instruments and alchemical ingredients, as well as an iron axe, a worn gam gambeson, and a healing potion. I want to learn more about the three classes. As a fighter, you have the easiest time in physical challenges. Uh, thanks to your superior equipment and hidden bonuses during dice rolls, you'll be physically be physically more capable than other classes. What opens unique opportunities during some social interactions is the best class for RPG beginners. Their weakness is their reliance on physical strength. Your special abilities won't be available to you if your vitality points drop to zero. 
The mage uses Numa, a versatile but limited pool of energy points that can be spent to cast a few humble spells. Magic won't protect you better than a sharp axe, but as a mage, you'll be able to heal faster while resting, detect magic in a mysterious area, distract beasts with a simple trick, and find a common tongue with other magic users. Using the mage's powers too freely will result in having no Numa left when you need it most. And the scholar will know more about the world's mysteries than you. Helping you take advantage of some unusual situations, your character will impress the locals with its knowledge. And you'll be able to read the sparse written clues without anyone's assistance. Scholars struggle with combat more than other classes, but with enough carefulness and exploration, you'll gain access to alchemical mixtures that will help you escape from many dangerous situations. I like Scholar, let's go with that! Ah, uh, okay, open your inventory, see your possessions. Taking hits will damage your armor, you can fix it in various settlements. Cool. Okay, so 15 minutes before dusk, and then armor 2 out of 4. So we have food, healing potion, pouch with coins, gambeson, cheapest type of armor yet surprisingly effective and very common, alchemical ingredients, travel set, writing instruments, and a simple battle axe. So return, save, load. I'm pretty... Oh no, it's actual save slots. That's nice. Archive. So we can actually see all of the dialogue that's go gone by. That's sick. I like it. You unpack and inspect your belongings. Your water skin isn't pierced, and the spare clothes are still here, just in case. You take a look at your wooden bowl and mug. Your cape, tinderbox, bandages, food rations, knife. Nothing special or too cumbersome. From time to time, your routine helps you avoid mis mistakes, but this doesn't make it any more exciting. I re return to the soldiers. They're at the table again, observing your beast and chatting between themselves. Your stomach growls at the sight of them eating out of wooden bowls. One more bowl was put at a previously unused end of the table. You can sit down on a tree log. I join them and take a look at the meal. It's cold gruel, the meal eaten in times of hardship. This specific bowl is filled with water, hog millet, and some strange looking cereals and blueberries. Welcoming you with a meal, even a, hum even a humble one, is beyond their duty. Soldiers live with and for their companions, constantly on the move from one part of the realm to another, making sacrifices to protect their group as they face dozens of hideous creatures. Their lives are filled with discipline, hardship, and camaraderie. Road Wardens, on the other hand, learn how to work by themselves. They seldom engage in open combat, patrolling the same roads for years. They help the settlement stay in touch, but also maintain commerce, settle down, forge friendships. When there are no laws to follow, they use their own judgment. Different responsibilities, different lifestyles. I eat quickly, not focusing on the taste, then speak with Tulia. Okay, so we now have starvation as well. I like that we're unlocking the UI as we go through this. She's focused... She's focused, and chooses her words carefully. She looks away only when she gathers her thoughts. I'm afraid I can tell you less than I would like, and less than I should. She nods towards the other soldier. As you can see, there's not a lot of us left. At the beginning of the summer, there were eight of us, including our previous lieutenant. Five are dead, and one has run away in tears. We are we're also strangers in this land, as her companion. Any piece of information may help me do my job. The man leads forward. His legs shake nervously. He sounds like a kid asking a bard to sing one more story, tell a joke, or do a magic trick. Whatever it takes to escape from boredom. His untrimmed beard hides a much younger face than you originally thought. What do the officials tell you? I expect not that much. No soul governs these lands. I share what I consider to be relevant. You tell the soldiers how little guidance you've received. Since this area is too far from Havlaven to keep it under control, you are warned that it's untamed and unknown. Who knows how many villages, bandits, and monsters may be found in these unmapped hills and forests. From time to time, new people come here to look for boundless opportunities. Most of, the th yeah, most of them never return. Do they turn into walking corpses or find what they're looking for? No soul could tell me, so I was looking for your guidance. The lieutenant drinks from her cup and crosses her legs, ankle on knee. Sitting her chair makes you doubt she'll ever find a comfortable position. Oh, seeing her chair makes you doubt she'll ever find a comfortable position. Where should we start? What should I know about the penin peninsula? I'll tell you what I know, and you'll be the judge, says the lieutenant. How long did it take you to get here from the city? On a decent palfrey, I guess it would be three, four days? When you confirm, she continues. From here, you can reach the coast in about a day, as long as you don't make any stops. Do you know the situation? Why no ships can get here? You nod. The sea route to Hovlaven. Hovlaven? Official. The sea route allows Havlavin officials 
to keep in touch with coastal villages, collect tax taxes, move the soldiers, collect lumber, deliver tools, but maintaining order on a wild coast such as this one is like filling the ocean depths with coins. Because of the rocks, you can hardly stop a ship five miles from the shore, and the boats can't get much closer. He nods. I don't know much about fishing, but there's not that many people living by the shore, and they don't crave to stay in touch with the city folk. As she pauses, her companion carries on. No soul from the north would ever come to the camp, but when we travel to the roadside inn, Pell to the north, they're happy to trade and play dice. Why not just stay at one of the, one of the settlements? The man clears his throat. I mean, you know, we're to guard this road if this camp is our post, and well... He turns to Tulia. She lowers her voice. Don't take it the wrong way, dude, but you are a devout soul. Oh, this is interesting. So... Like most city folk, I believe most people should unite their strength to overcome the threats of nature and dark magic. Everyone will be judged for both good and evil deeds and part of the United Church. For many years, I've supported a monastery that does its best to advance mankind's spiritual growth, artistry, herbalism, and magical research. All of the teachings of the Order of Truth. Small village. For me, my freedom's shell... Freedom of shell. Oh, yeah. Shell is in, like, body. Numa and soul are the main virtues of life. My community is unique and independent, so are its members. So the fellowship. Strong connection to nature and spirits and follow a path of my ancestors. Some of my beliefs may be considered sinister and treacherous by the city folk, call me a pagan, or there's no evidence of the rite's existence, and all of the mystical tales are explained by magic. No, I'm not. I'm gonna go Order of Truth. It feels very much that uh, my scholar would have that, maybe. Or we would straight up just be um, agnostic, uh, agnostic, agnostic, antagonistic, ha, <laughs> uh, or outright atheistic, but let's go Order of Truth just for extra lore. Oh, I see. She looks away. Hesitantly looks away. I don't know much about the River of Faith, but I'm sure we're not that different. I'm a unite myself, she says with a sort of pride in her voice, so she follows the United Church. Maybe just explain what you're thinking of. The people here are disquieting. Very, every few words, she taps the table with her finger. Their traditions won't help them negotiate with the officials here. She starts to draw lines with her index finger, as she, if she's pointing at an invisible map. The peninsula is connected with roads, like a big circle. In the northwest, you'll find a weird village in a bog. It's not exactly pagan, and I don't think so. Even as a priest who claims to be an Aramite, you nod. She means a fellowship. They do crazy shit. Her companion ch chips in. They use the dead to cut down trees and dig in soil. Once I saw it, I begged to never return there. I see. You've heard tales such as this one since you were a child. If an isolated settlement manages to survive without a city's influence, its customs and traditions grow more and more alien. Every generation learns how to adapt to the dangerous conditions they have to deal with, and the ritualistic pagan traditions muddy the river of faith. The United Church often warns its members about the crazy druids, necromancers, and blood mages, the bringers of doom, the traitors to humankind. Were you able to speak to these necromancers? You can see why we're not eager to go there. If we could avoid it, the lieutenant chuckles. Maybe they'll be more willing to, w more welcoming to a road warden. The roads are dangerous, with little to no shelters. People need your help. The man in the shirt turns a bit and points a finger to the northwest. If you're heading to the undead village, you'll get to an inn first, and soon. Tulia nods. Pelt to the north is a safe place. You can't talk with the innkeeper guards. Oh, you can talk with the innkeeper the guards. Ask them about the road. How about the east? She stares off at, uh, across the camp. Hard to tell. We went there only once. There are hills, forests, rivers. We saw a tunnel sculpted in leaves and branches, but we didn't enter it. Wilderness all around. Any monster worth mentioning? Anything that could catch my mount? There's all sorts of beasts. The man starts to count on his fingers. Goblins, treants, cats, large and small. Runners, howlers, wolves, spiked boars. Mouflon either... Mouflon eaters, griffins, but we managed to stay away. Some could catch up with most mounts. Tulia glances at her companion. The palfrey should be fine. The trees are so tall that flying creatures keep to the coast and mountains. There's not that many humans around, and the animals are busy fighting amongst themselves. They fight more for food than territory. The soldier cracks his knuckles. Don't provoke them and ride fast. Just count on luck. That's all I need to know. Oh boy, there's a lot of lore. Well, we're in, uh, we're in for the long haul, at least for this video. 
Any ideas what happened to the previous war road warden? Julia takes a deep breath. Aren't you a bit late for the, a rescue mission? We haven't heard from him in almost half a year. The soldiers spec speak a bit between themselves, trying to get their story straight. They confirm that he had stopped by their camp a few times, but stopped showing up at all in early summer. The bearded soldier starts to scratch at the table with the tip of his knife without looking at you. I don't remember his voice. Always busy, drowning in things to take care of. It sits somewhere, sharpen a sword, fixes loud mail, clean clothes, write notes on that wax tablet of his. Yep, and leave at dawn. Unlike us, Asterion, Asterion never gets bored. Julia lets out a joyless chuckle. He's secretive, but some of the locals speak about him warmly. Maybe he just doesn't like us. Sounds like you're not sure if he's dead or not. If anyone knows, they won't tell us. Maybe someone's keeping him in a basement. The man carves with a passion. We haven't seen him, or his Saurian. Some something ate him, I bet. The officials have hired you, right? They don't expect him to return. Richer road wardens often use four-legged meat-eating Saurians as their mounts. They have to be tamed and trained since they're hatching, but unlike horses, can easily defend themselves from many monsters. At least your palfrey is fast and reliable, and won't suddenly sink its teeth into an innocent passerby. You know what he was looking for. Maybe he left you a message? Neither one of us had any insight into his dealings, says Tulia. My predecessor left me no clues. We also took a look at Hysterian stuff. Wait. She raises her open palm. I almost forgot. Oh. She stands up and heads to a nearby tent. He has kids, in a village near Hoflaven. I was planning to take all his things there. A pouch, a second spear, a decent bow, some potions. Quite a treasure. She glances at you, but I'd much prefer to bring them the truth about their father. You want me to find out what happened to him in exchange for his stuff? Here's the catch. She just dusts off the hilt of her sword. We hired a messenger to ask the commanders for further orders. Since she hasn't returned and you know nothing about her, she either ran away or something happened to her. She sighs with resignation. We're meant to stay here until fall. What do you think? Come see us, tell us what you've learned about the man, and we'll get back to Hovlevin together? If you think about your real mission, you're planning to return to Hovlevin in the early fall anyway. If he's alive, I don't think he's going to be happy about me taking away all of his possessions. True. But he's considered dead. I doubt he'll spare you anything, and who knows, you might just find his shell living, lying on the roadside tomorrow. He wears a mail, uses a spear mostly. Maybe five feet tall, but stout. Long red beard, short hair, pale face, rarely smiles. She glances at her companion. But after he adds nothing, she sits down and stretches out her legs. Find out what happened to him. Dead, alive, left. Just let me know. I've lost my rope. Could you spare one? You're in luck. She heads towards one of the crates and moves aside a large linen sack, revealing a rope. She brings it back and nonchalantly, sh nonchalantly sits down on her chair. Take it. I was planning on leaving it behind. Take a closer look. A fine rope. What happened to your squad? The man shrugs. Bandits happened. And monsters. A strong band, though. His champ companion chimes in. When we got to the peninsula in spring, we saw some people living in this camp. The lieutenant decided to avoid it and look for an inn, but to travel through the night for a bit. The bearded soldier scoffs and crosses his arms, but she carries on. If he had decided otherwise, we would have all died that day. The innkeeper explain, explained that the camp is a trap, that the armed ones pretend to be soldiers. Stay there at night and lose everything you have. That... is interesting. Sounds like slave hunters. Julia sighs. Very, very much so. They killed some, took others away. Who knows where. They're letting the northerners go, hoping to avoid their wrath. It kind of worked. As the soldier, we asked them for help, but they refused. We had to clear the entire camp on our own. And that's why three of our people died. Don't exaggerate. It's not like the lieutenant didn't make a mistake. We wanted to get rid of them and take over their camp. But we didn't know the enemy well enough. We were outnumbered, and they had an ice mage among them. She looks at you. At least we cleared the road, saved lives. You mentioned monsters as well? Nothing that would surprise you. Those of us who survived the skirmish were young, too inexperienced to spend a summer in this place without a good healer and didn't trust me. And they didn't trust me. One of them got caught by a tree and another one ignored my orders to perform some sort of ritual hunt. The werebear tore her to pieces. The last one tried to act tough, didn't tell us he had a cut on his hand while cleaning his gambeson. She lets out a ghastly chuckle. We had to cut it off and was... He was so ashamed that he decided to walk north, find a new life, and disappear. Idiot. What a colorful journey the man tries to drink from his mug, but it's empty. We've made the place safer. 
Barely. Tulia seems tired. And who knows if it was worth the lives and effort. How did you become lieutenant? Not much of a story, honestly. She looks at her hand, which is currently rolling a mug over the table. In the city, there's a strict order of... What should I call it? She exchanges looks with her companion. But he can't help her. Well, leadership succession, I guess. Hovleven... Hovleven? Hovleven? Hovleven. I'll go with that one. Hovleven chief selects commanders. These select lieutenants. Those put their soldiers in order of priority. If a lieutenant dies, they get replaced by the next soldier in line. Eh, not exactly. When we fought the bandits, our lieutenant was hit by a slingshot. His boyfriend jumped up to help him, but failed to protect either of them from a sm spell. It's like a ball of ice that hung above them and exploded, piercing their heads, completely avoiding their shield. Really unpleasant. She pauses. And you were the third in line? Uh, you were the third one in line, is that right? Basically, yeah. She says without enthusiasm. I didn't plan to become a leader, though. I'll get demoted once we return to the city. I'd prefer to follow anyway. What was your squad's mission? Lieutenant looks in your eyes. You know, the usual. Making the road safe. Keeping people alive. Explain it may, might be important for me to know what they've tried to accomplish. I can't really tell you. Let's just say it would be nice to have a reliable outpost somewhere nearby. A place where you can always find a group of fighters willing to protect you in the name of the law. She tilts her head back. Now if you have any other questions. Anything I should know about the camp? The story's brief. Some merchants built the camp to have an extra stop for mules and donkeys just between the inn and the southern villages. There's plenty of grass here and a pond nearby. When the peninsula grew dangerous, the camp stood abandoned, from time to time serving as a shelter for travelers. The bandits came here in spring, further paralyzing the exchange of information between the northern and the southern settlements. Since these highwaymen are no more, the situation may reverse. Time will tell. You can sleep wherever you want, the man concludes their tale. Though don't expect us to wake you without uh, don't expect to wake up without a pain in your back. If you're me, where would you go next? The soldier answers quickly, to the inn of course. He grabs his empty mug. The one northwest from here. If you can't afford the room, the main hall is free of charge. The locals rarely gather there. The northern road is much more traveled, mentions Tulia. Well, the hunters will tell you about this and that, and you can have a chance to introduce yourself. The innkeeper can listen, and knows many souls. Any tips on how I can make a good first impression with him? She smirks. Avoid cheap jokes. Stick to trade. Don't waste his time. Show him that you can be relied on. It's getting late. We should prepare for the night. I agree. Tulia sighs with relief. And may you do better than Asterion did. Stay vigilant. She winks at you, shattering the mask of a soldier. Thank you for your help. Okay, stay tidy to have a better chance to influence others. Go to the barrel and splash your face. What makes you even more what makes you even more aware of how much you need a bath? After the night, it'll only get worse. Your horse is already napping, too anxious to lay down. Prepare for my watch. The soldier in the shirt is eager to guide you. Just observe the area. There are plenty of griffins around, but they won't try to jump over the palisade. Probably. Better to watch out for apes. They climb up and carry out any food they can find. And there's this one really loud were- were ilk that keeps smelling the wall. Though it's never tried to get in. It points at the gate. The lieutenant and I will block the entrances. They're quite heavy, so if anyone comes here looking for shelter, better call to us to help you out. And if someone is being chased by wolves or anything, better throw them the rope instead. He scratches his head. If it gets cold, feel free to make a fire. The best place is the watchtower. You may want to put a blanket there, or something. The watchtower? He gives you a long puzzled look. Oh, here. He points to a pile of crepes. Just climb up to uh, crates. Not crepes. Just climb up to the tallest one. You'll have a great view of the northern side. The more dangerous side. And also, I know you're tired after all that riding. He points at the tent on the other side of the camp. You can handle a couple hours of sleeping on the ground if you wish. Go there after me and rest. Just this once. At least I have a pallet inside. Thanks a lot. You put your blanket on the tallest crate and sit down. The night is warm. The sporadic summer breeze brings gentle refreshment. From time to time your back aches. Oh, I like the line of sight. By climbing the crates we can now see this area that we hadn't previously been able to see. So, uh, from time to time your back aches. You force yourself to keep your eyes open. The light of the moon helps you focus on the tall grasses. For most of the time you spot small critters and birds, but there are exceptions. At one point, the three horned deer is trying to challenge one another. Before they clash antlers, a two-legged dragonling appears, leading a much smaller offspring. The furry beasts try to intimidate the predators with roars and aggressive head movements. 
After a few moments, both sides walk away slowly, not willing to risk the fight, nor admit their defeat. I don't let it distract me. I keep looking around. You hear the death screams of distant prey and the mating calls of monkeys. Runners are chasing a gray hare. A group of musk oxen lazily chew the grass, preparing themselves to sleep. A dusk fox is running together with the lynx, making playful screeches. Thankfully, you never have to intervene. You just sit there, watching the not-so-distant forest, trying to outlast your sleepiness. You can only guess how much time has passed. Once you feel you've had enough, you climb down and go to a tent. Waking up the bearded man with just a couple of words, you confirm that nothing important has happened. I gather my things and squeeze into the tent. Use my bag as a pillow and my blanket. put my blanket on the pallet. Cover myself with my cloak. Sleeping in a tent is not the stuff of dreams, It's but it's a much welcomed rest. The pallet keeps the cold soil away and the moonlight saves, uh, saves the outside world from the eerie gloom. You listen to your own breath and find a comfortable position. Your job starts tomorrow. I vo focus on the real goal of my journey. The Merchant Guild wants to take control of this realm. Your wardening duties are secondary. First and foremost, you need to explore the peninsula. Learn about the territory, resources, and threats. Get to know the locals, and if you can, convince them to consider negotiations with Hovleven... Hovlevens? Hovlevens... Hovlevens? I don't know. Hovlevens. Officials and traders. Could the tribes resist the soldiers, or be a threat to the priests of the United Church? Are there any forbidden practices that need to be eradicated, such as blood magic, necromancy, robbery, or slavery? At least I have time. I need to be as thorough as I can. Once you finish your reconnaissance, you should speak with Tulia and return to Havleven. There, you'll return or you'll report back to your employees and get your reward. In the meantime, you have your own goal to pursue. Okay. Oh. Interesting. I'm going to go with this one. I just want to help people. Make the region safer for the locals and newcomers alike. So new entry. A new shelter unlocked and help others. You can't travel during the night. Press the sleep button to rest. Interesting. So your half-asleep senses are catching the sounds of the wild forest. Your instincts keep you alert and anxious. So the pleasant, humid, late summer air evens it out slowly. You're thinking about your goal, but you need to gather your rest. All I can do now is rest. Sleeping in a tent. You can spend the night in a borrowed tent. It's nothing special, but it'll protect you from the wind and rain. And the ground won't be painfully hard nor cold. What is this? I need to eat and go back. So am I going to lose food and appearance, of course? You're woken up by the sunlight, well rested and ready. Without haste, you gather your things. Only a couple of breaths, you notice a weird smell like a roast. Not, no, burning meat. Burning rotten meat. Disgust crawls into your consciousness. You exit the tent. The horse is looking around nervously. Your bags are where you left them. You see an open gate. Go outside to see what's happening. Both soldiers are standing by a humble pyre. The man in the shirt looks at it com contemplatively. Julia is the first to address you. Dude, she greets you with a nod. We use the ho horse's manure for the flames, so don't worry about cleaning it up. You see a corpse among the flames. It's impossible to tell if it belongs to a male or a female, but it was an adult. The burning process won't be over for a couple more hours. A traveler or an undead? The latter. A young one. She lacked the pneuma to understand that she couldn't get inside the camp without climbing. I stabbed her with a spear from a safe distance. She shifts her weight. One more fog and she'd be a real threat. Even now it took a couple of hits to knock her down. Sooner or later, every human shell wakes up, gaining more strength with each soul it devours and each mo moment it spends in the fogs. Burning the dead is not a religious practice, it's a necessity. Soldiers, priests, village mayors, even road wardens. Making a large pyre takes a lot of time, but it saves lives. Julia called this undead a she. Most Unites hesitate to do so. Time for me to leave. Running from the reek, huh? I don't blame you. She walks with you for a few steps. Find us here if you need us, or if you learn what happened to Aster Asterian. There's enough ground here for you to rest. Safe travels. These words make you stop, an old farewell, mocked in a number of songs and tales, but you hear no scorn in Tulia's voice. You wonder how many acts of kindness like this one you're going to experience in the days to follow. She returns to the pyre. I prepare myself for my journey. Okay, so use the travel button to see the map move to another area. Somehow miss the fact that your mount is already saddled more warmed up. You double check the equipment, but don't need to fix anything. The soldiers were diligent. Normally, preparing any palfrey for a long journey takes a lot of time. You put on your gambeson and make sure that your axe is 
tightly attached to your belt. Then get in the saddle. The palfrey knickers, ready to leave. It's time for you to get to the crossroads north of here. Travel. I'm gonna quick save. Okay. Travel north. Ooh. Even in a later hour, you wouldn't expect to meet any travelers in the valley. The warm summer breeze lures your mount forward, but the serene chirping of birds is quietly replaced by the distance distracting screeching and gurgles. Coming from further down the path, you soon find a pack of pack of four-legged griffins. They're larger than foxes and merge the features of birds and furred beasts. Each one is of a different size, coat, and colors, and their temperaments are just as varied. Their fronts are covered with vivid feathers, while their rears have darker fur. Their wings are massive, making them impressive jumpers, but they're too heavy to fly. About two dozen beasts are yelling, brawling, and chasing each other around, them, or ch chasing each other around, blocking your path. Consider my op options. You can't enter the forest blindly. If these or other creatures were to chase you, the thicket would be disastrous for your horse. There are reasons why travelers stay as close to the main roads as possible and why adventurers move in groups. Usually the safest approach would be to stay where you are and just wait for the back to get hungry. It may, however, take up take up to a couple hours. If you're thinking about your conversation with Tulia, you've got a lot to do, and time may be of the essence. A random chance. So we can quick save. I'm probably going to save scum a bit. Oh. On it, on occasion, you can use the Scholar's Education to unlock unique interactions. Knowledge. I mix black powder with gladden that grows nearby and the dried skunk swirl from my bag. Once I ignite it and throw it at the griffins, they'll scatter. Most city folk feel aversion towards black powder, and you touch it with great care. You can learn more about your abilities in the character sheet. Ooh. Take a look at this. So knowledge, you're literate, your education helps you solve many mysteries. Alchemy, with access to an alchemy table and proper ingredients, you can brew useful balms and potions. I'm not very clean at all. Regular vitality, clothes need no special repairs, not stained with blood, and you've got a regular outfit. Interesting. Ugh. So there's the religion, but also your faith. Lies. Lying gives you quick benefits, but may turn against you. I like the fact that it keeps these. Sewing experience, gambling experience, spared animals. Depending on your beliefs, saving and sparing animals either makes you a weakling or soothes your soul. Interesting. Engaging in combat helps you, helps you during future fights that involve random chance. I like this. It very much feels kind of D&D adjacent in the best possible way. So, uh, most city folk feel aversion towards black powder and you touch it with great care. The odor of the plants make you feel dizzy. But what's more important is that the griffins have wolf-like sensitivity to smells and noises. A few of the beasts turn their head towards you as you approach. Approach the pack with a bag in your hand. You ignite your missile and throw it forward. At first the creatures surround the so source of smoke, then growl in disgust. Even putting their beaks to the ground, they flee, allowing you to continue your journey. I climb on the horse and cover my nose. I really need to find a proper alchemy set. <sighs> Let's see, keep track of your achievements as your journey unfolds. So, my name is Dude, I used to be a scholar. Uh, let's see, journal? Archive, I, okay, I'm confused. It said keep track of it, unless it's this here. Maybe it is. The road splits. According to what the soldiers have told you, you may find a safe inn by turning left. The forest to the right is lush, and the trail overgrown. Kids used to have this song. How did it go? The harshest pathway leads to the dragon's lair. Those who search for treasure, do you truly dare? The signpost in front of you doesn't make the situation much clearer. It was put here by someone who can't write. For folks who can't read. Covered in old red paint, it points east. Blood there as people say. Danger to be found. There's no, not a soul to ask for guidance. I look at my horse. What's its name? Sodal. No. What do I name my horse? I don't know. I wonder if there's like a random horse name generator. It usually is. Hell yeah, horse names. 
Dylan Moonfeet. <laughs> oh, I'm just gonna hit this until we find something fun. Uh, Fury, <laughs> Captain. Uh, let's see, Snow Flash, Samson, Trinity, Fast Blossom, Speckles, Checks. You know, oddly enough, I really like Checks. That's not checks. <laughs> All right, there we go. Checks is a pe is peaceful as you stroke its mane. Maybe it can help you choose a path. But you've spent many years together, happy to go on. It takes a couple steps forward. It's bought a few berry shrubs and wild cabbages, but they need a few weeks to gain maturity. Travel. Oh, let's go to the inn. I'm here for information. Checks trots with ease, unbothered by the few branches covering the beaten road. The bird songs and distant howls draw your attention to the forest, which gets sparser and brighter. You spot boars, roe deer, and saurians. The sight of a nearby wolf pack worries you, but once you push your hips to forward and your health palfrey enters a canter, the beasts don't even begin a pursuit. The speed alone will protect you from any dangers. You notice a stone tower, taller than the trees. Must be the inn I've heard about. Inns like this one fit the regions traveled by merchants, but you wouldn't expect to find expect a place of this size in a forsaken peninsula. The stone and lumber must have been transported from far away, and the workers, guarded by expensive mercenaries, lived for many seasons in a primitive hamlet, subsisting on salted supplies. There are seemingly no cracks in the wall, and the building was whitewashed only a few few years back. The road is wide and beaten. Dozens of souls could hide hide if not in or hide if not in the buildings then at least in the yard the expenses and labor put into this fortress were worth many trading ships three armed people are on the ramparts though you only see what's above their waistline they're leaning on the parapet right next to the gate and you notice a glimpse of a smile they were gambesons each of them died differently yellow green and linen gray approach the gate a woman in yellow armor leans forward she has long curly disordered red hair pointing in every possible direction. This combination of colors doesn't work at all. In the woods, one would have to shout to draw this much attention. There's still a fair distance between the two of you, but she speaks loudly. I hadn't seen a horse for years now. I just said that it's weird to see a, such a large jackass, huh? Her voice is young and strong, with an accent that reminds you of the villages spread around Ho Hovlaven. But no jackass would wear a saddle, I'd say. She exchanges a few words with a male guard wearing green, giving you time to move closer. Well, this one says there really are donkey saddles. Say, Traveler, how hard is it to ride a horse? I laugh. You wouldn't believe it. The lessons were a pain. You get off your horse and imitate the silly walk from the, from the day that followed your first long journey. When your whole shell was crying, you illustrate the pain as you move your hand from your back to your hips, then thighs. In return, the guards tell you about the time when they had to carry their friend with bitten off legs for three days straight through the heart of the woods. Meanwhile, the other guards open the gate. You may be in a good mood, the woman in, yellow, in the yellow jacket smiles at you, but don't get too noisy when you talk to our boss. The man never smiles as the world's suffering sculpted onto his face. She leads you under the roof, which your palfrey can rest, tethered with a cord to a wooden post. Some near old hay. Once you're ready, go inside, speak to our boss. Maybe you're hungry. The other guards take care of various chores. They peek at your mount every now and then as, you're, as they're splitting firewood, cleaning their clothes, and weeding the garden patches and moving chairs. Two of them are making rope. Making a rope. You head toward the inn, hearing the piercing scream of a boar from the other side of the yard. Open the door. The locked windows make the air stuffy, and the weak fire in the stove hardly lightens up the hall. A muscular man is sweeping the floor. Okay, at an inn in the morning, you, you can... Oh. If you're at an inn in the morning, you can spend the entire day on resting. Um, okay, so a muscular man is sweeping the floor near the stairs, but after he glances at you, he leans the broom against the wall and heads to the counter. You're lucky to show up. His voice is deep and soft, with a city-like accent. He observes you with a keen attention, yet avoids your eyes. I have a keg of decent ale, wormwood, bog myrtle, juniper berries, cat's foot. He fills a mug carefully and puts it on the countertop. Gonna spoil soon. Maybe, today, maybe. And we don't drink here before the even. Get to see the good stuff going to waste. His skin is dark, almost purple. A rare thing among the southern tribes. And the hair is naturally bluish. His clothes are quite fancy for manual labor. The elegant tunic wouldn't stand out in the city square. 
the end of the counter. The planks led at a creek. After every step you make, so slow, uh, so you slow down a bit. You could almost hear that the innkeeper, or you could swear that the innkeeper made little to no noise. Here you go. He pushes the mug forward, but just so you know, my belt doesn't belong to Hovleven. You can sleep on the floor if you wish to, but if you want a better meal, you have to pay. We may have some leftovers from dinner, but I need to check. I won't stay here for long. I introduce myself. He nods and fills another mug, this time with water. I guess there's no point in waiting for Asterion then. I'm glad to see someone taking his place. Even my crew here hits the road only if they need to see the healers or howlers dell. And they're more than resourceful. A road warden is always going to find work here in the north. Though maybe not on the eastern road. He takes a mouthful of water and drinks it with a pleased sigh. There are no guests here at the time. Uh, at the time, or hardly ever. I can take a short break. For a brief moment, he meets your eyes. I drink the ale. The dark room and wooden walls of the mug make the liquid look as brown as a chestnut. The lee in the spring... Lee in spring hits your nose, and the first step... And the first step is even too complex, too flowery. While the brewer has used fancy ingredients, the exotic licorice run ruins the aftertaste. Now you know why there's so much left. Maybe it takes an acquired taste. Innkeeper nods. I was hoping to see someone willing to patrol the roads. Maybe you'll help me with the worrying thought I have. Which is? There are brigands in the woods. Our place is a stronghold, so I'm not afraid of an open strike. But they've gotten more active in the last two years. One day, they may steal our furs. And I have no doubt they're, they're the reason the merchants come here only once. Having bandits around gets expensive. He rubs his hands together, camouflaging his paws. I want you to reach Howler's Dell, northwest from here. It's the largest settlement around. I'm sure you'll get there sooner or later. Ask Thais the mayor... Thais? Thais. The mayor about Glacia, the bloodthirsty wolf of a woman. I've heard rumors about a raid in the north. Glacia is ready to break the truce with the locals. I'm willing to join forces with him to get rid of her band. She... Or he looks at a nearby dragon bone. Not too difficult, right? Just do when you have the chance. A couple days won't make a difference. Pay you two coins when you get back with the news. Fine? I nod. Let's see. Great. What else do you need? So I'm hungry. I'm going to start by talking to him. I could eat something. Do you have any leftovers? Yes. I feed them to our boar. I won't, ha I won't give them away for nothing. Tells you to wait, then leaves the building for a few minutes and returns with a wooden bucket and a long stick ending with a hook. Go through the gate and turn left. You'll see a bunch of bushes. We need some berries. Bring me a bucket full and you'll be done in a half an hour or so. Your horse could use a nap anyway and I'll prepare something for you. The hook is not made of metal or wood. It's a long curved claw, almost black. I reach for the tools. Half an hour. That's a lot for a lot for berry picking. The tools are cold, but not too heavy. You notice a pair of thick gloves at the end of the bucket. Ah, the berries aren't the problem. The innkeeper smirks. Unlike the snakes, better scare them away with a stick or move them with a hook. And protect your hands. The little ones won't eat you. But don't get bitten. I'm sure you know how to be patient. Fine, I'll go right away. Okay. You step outside. Chex is lazily looking around. At this hour, the armorer's workshop is closed. You should go outside and forage for berries. The innkeeper knew what he was talking about. You put on the gloves and look through the bushes look through the bushes from a safe distance. It doesn't take long before you notice that the first serp notice the first serpent lying on a rock somewhere in the thicket. The creatures are not that large, and even some of them hiss at you or slither closer. The jabs of the hook keep them at a distance. You don't know much about these berries. They're round and reddish. You wouldn't trust such a color even if you were looking for food in the wilderness. The plants don't have thorns, but the leaves are harsh and you make sure to thoroughly cover your skin with your clothes. You have to look through many bushes to fill the bucket, but the presence of insects and snakes doesn't allow you to relax. I notice this shrub that's not like the others. One of the bushes in the back has more berries than others. They're purple, as you, and as you squeeze one of them, you recognize that these are marsh buhls. Small amounts, they're added to pies, sauces, and beverages, known for their delicate sourness and sweetness. Unique, but not intrusive. Still, eating a cup of them will make one sick, if not poisoned. You're surprised to see them in a meadow, far away from a wetland. You could use them at an alchemy table if you can find it. For now, you put a fistful into one of your jars. The others are still a bit greenish. I gather the berries and return to the gate. You've returned to the courtyard. 
Two of the guards are preparing or participating in a friendly skirmish. Their wrestling is accompanied by a crowd. I enter the inn. The locked windows make the air stuffy, and the weak fire in the stove hardly lightens up the hall. The innkeeper is sitting on a stool, looking at the flames in the stove and holding a carrot and a knife without using them. So, you again. Need anything? Put his fruits on the counter. Great. He peeks inside the bucket. Got a cabbage stew with a few goose chunks for you. I'd serve it even to the merchants, if there were any around. The meal is warm and filling. It's well seasoned, not overcooked. Like I've said, I rarely have food to spare, but feel free to ask if you ever stop by. You may be lucky, and I've been cooking my whole life. Thanks. Let's see, and how did that old hook of mine work out for you? I see you still have it in your hands. I give him the hook. I'm fine. Takes his tools from you and nods. Anything else? Looking for Asterion, the previous road warden. Are you now? He goes to the table and invites you to sit down with him. I don't think I'm going to be of much help. He rests his elbow on the table and tabletop and grunts quietly to clear his throat. But I do want to f I do want you to find him, so... When asked about his intentions, he measures his words. Asteria and I made a risky deal, well, a very promising one. Last time he was here, he took 50 coins, my half of the investment. Knocks on the table with his fist anxiously. If you get my coin, or at least find out what happened to the guy, I'll make sure you won't be disappointed after bringing me the news. Could it be that Asteria stole the coins and ran away? Looks at the window and starts to play with a shutter. I just think that Asteria ain't the kind of soul that would do such a thing. For him, it wasn't any, it wasn't much of a fortune, and I'd risk saying that he earned my trust. Not only mine, you know. It's easy for a road warden to make connections. He always had places to go, things to take care of. He rubs the table with his thumb, as if trying to clean an invisible stain. I've asked travelers. I've sent a couple of my pals to find him. No real news. I knew, know he stayed in the White Marshes for a day. I was meant to do something for the people there. It's a village in the northwest. Just stay on the main road until you reach the bogs, then enter them. You may get there before dusk. Let me know once you find anything, and we may return to this whole investment thing. I'll think about... I'll think about it. But can you tell me about the peninsula? What can anyone say? This place doesn't even have a name unless it's an old... Uh, unless there's an old book in an archive that no soul knows about. You know what I call everything from here to the coast? The hunting ground. He glances at your eyes, but it's not us who hunt. Keep that in mind. But the beasts in... But the beasts in all shapes and forms... His voice, or his words, gain confidence slowly, which is strengthened by his deep voice. I've lived in this inn for over ten years now, and I've only seen a couple of roads, a couple of places. It's just, once you get here, and you see how harsh it is to hit the road, you only have more reasons to stay in the warm stove, at the warm stove, behind a wall, even if it's suffocating. He looks towards the windows. I'm sure you've heard a lot already, that the people don't build hamlets anymore. There are no more ibexes from the south. The traders stay only for a few days. All of our iron is used for cauldrons, not swords or tools. What will I find traveling west? Well, there are hills nearby, and you'll find a village, maybe an hour away from here. It was destroyed by beasts almost a decade ago. Nothing more to see there. The goblins live there now, so most people just travel around it. And they say it's haunted, but who knows? Who cares? He crosses his arms and starts to sway back and forth, gathering his thoughts. You'll get to a large tree on the edge of the swamp. For the locals, it's sacred. You're not used to hearing someone mentioning pagans, as if there's nothing unusual about them. There's a small path south, which leads to an old mine in the mountains. Nothing to find there, but keep riding north and you'll find Howler's Den. Set at a clean brook, farmers live there, and mouflons and druids. They'll lead you... Oh, they'll let you stay for a night, but they're not cheap. If anyone thinks my prices are bad, it means they ain't been to Ape Ale Inn yet. The lens had a gentle smile. A nod. I know only a bit about the ne next settlement, Old Pagos. The soil there ain't too fertile, so they work in their quarry and help other settlements build things in exchange for crops. The forests and hills ain't too harsh, but the seekers have a small monastery nearby. In the in the mount uh, nearby in the mountains I don't care much about them they keep to themselves and they don't pay well if i remember right my character is a seeker yeah yes now hold up this is west so it might be useful if i want to go there since i have a connection not much of one but still 
The third village is unknown to me. White marshes, set in, a, set in the bogs. I've heard it smells like a griffin's lair. I've heard a lot of nasty rumors about the place, but I won't share them. I don't want to be a lie spreader. So, three villages, really. Howlers is the one near the monastery, whatever it's called. Oh. Howlers, the one near the monastery, whatever it's called, and marshes. Don't let their beds and palisades fool you, though. Weird people live there. Don't tell them more than you need to. I wonder if it's something he would tell other travelers as well. Are the eastern roads as rough as I've heard? Pretty much. Don't leave the main road, I say. Not far from here, you'll find an old dolmen. A few of my people have had to spend a night there, and monkeys stole food and gods from their bag bags. It was their fault. One of them had fallen asleep in the middle of a watch, but you know. The eastern forests are wild and the roads are rough. Almost no soul lives there. One day all these roads will be swallowed by the trees again. The furth furthest my team has ever gone was the home of the Enchantress. Just stay on track until you reach the crossroads, right near an abandoned watchtower. From there, turn east. You'll recognize the place. It's a nice home in a lonely meadow, surrounded by a wall. It looks towards the closed window, then at you again. Kind of like our walls, but simpler, without coding. She lives as a hermit. Eudocia. I don't even know how she survives there. But if you don't have decent coin, you won't find much there. So, back to the crossroads. If you turn left instead, you'll see a road. People stay away from it. It connects, to the, it connects the tower and the monastery. A shortcut between two sides of the peninsula. I was warned by the locals not to use it. It already belongs to the beasts. Have you ever been to the northern coast? I only know about another inn. It's far from here. Maybe a day on foot. A bit less on the eastern side. His eyes once again focus on the floor. I've never been there, but I've heard it's a safe place. Close to the villages... Close to villages of fishers and hunters, but I don't know much about them. That's all I need. Uh, let's see, about Glaucia's ba band. He freezes, observing you, your hand silently. Okay, I'm on it. Okay. I didn't expect to find an inn of this size in a place like this. Ah, so you know a thing or two after all. His mocking tone is soon replaced by a gentle smile. It was built long before we arrived. It didn't work out well for the previous owners. Once the war ended, they left. Not enough travelers, bad trade, the villagers stick to themselves. We, however, came prepared, and now we're prospering. When you ask how they can afford all the supplies, he runs his finger through his dark hair. I'm not against running an inn. I'm not against running an inn, but we don't rely on guests. We're the ones doing all the trading. My hunters are a clever bunch and stay safe in the woods. In exchange for furs, claws, and bones, we get what we need, and more. Both from the south and the north. He relaxes in his chair. We have a good life here. We spent a whole lot on armor, crossbows, lumber, and spears. But another 10, maybe 20 years, we'll have enough savings to move to Hovleven and not work another day in our lives. We take risks, but smartly. The team is stronger than ever. I have big plans for us. It's surprising to find a purple skinned man so far in the north. I ain't seen a soul looking like this since my ma died, he shrugged. Not a fascinating tale. Let's just say I wasn't part of the invasion. Yet I'm glad it freed all of those who were chained by the cities and their corsairs. Looks at the wall. I'm Laysun, by the way. But I rarely hear the name. A good story behind the inn's name? I mean, there's a story, but not a good one. He clears his throat. <clears> throat. For years I wanted to have an inn called the Pelts, but not. But in my city it would be in bad taste. Taverns and inns named with a single word were cheap and had a nasty reputation. There was the Claw and Mugger. Basilisk and blissful, I think. The good places used at least two words: empty barrel, a rose and a hamlet, rose and a helmet. Empress's smile, pig head, was the exception. It was a real dive. He chuckles. My soul is still just a pelt. Pelts are what we came here for, and what will make us reach our goals. Any rumors worth sharing? Crosses his arms. I don't like to talk about people who ain't nearby, but you know what you're doing. What are you wondering about? Tell me about... Oh. Name people you're interested in. Oh, okay. Journal. Humans. Uh, Tulia. Let's see if he knows anything about Tulia. I ain't seen Tulia for quite some time. Since her squad vanished in the fogs, she's been careful. Glad to know she's still alive. She's too inexperienced to lead others to battle, I think. He shrugs. Like most people, she needs to follow others. But she already knows that. She already knows that. There's nothing worse than a fighter too stupid to limit their ambitions. Okay, that's all I need for now. Ah, uh, let's see. What does he have for sale? 
need to go pick up a few things for you. Some food for your travels to start with. Apples, nuts, sausage. Not too many at once. We need to maintain our supplies. I've got elk fur I don't need. Its buyer was caught by a pack of red wolves. Nice for a sleeping spot. Just as nice for a wall. Almost un An almost untouched soap. Priceless for a traveler. You can't tell if he's sarcastic. Made of fine oak ash. Strong. Though you should have some better supplies if you start your own bathhouse. After you mention you'd like to like something more useful for these roads, he looks down. I don't have any blades or armor to spare, but if you pay well, you can take one of our crossbows and a bunch of quarrels. A U bow, wood cords, and the trigger need a little bit of oil. It's as good as you can get without soaking it in magic. It takes a bit of muscle to draw, but even a 16-year-old could handle it. Won't sell it cheap, but I'm ready to give a discount to a helpful ally. Let's see what he's got. Okay, so how much money do I have? Ten. So, rations. So the crossbow and elk fur are too expensive. Oak-based balm that burns skin on contact. I'm gonna grab the soap. And the rations, but I think we'll leave the rest. Because I think we're too poor for everything else and the soap might be useful. Uh, do, you, do I have anything you'd like to buy? No, I don't think I have anything worth anything. Oh, that's... I see. Winged hourglass, a steel pendant hanging from leather, leather strap. It's common to wear such jewelry to demonstrate one's allegiance to the right. And then we do have a healing potion. I don't think I have any resources I want to ho hold on to. Or, there, there are no resources I want to sell. Ah, uh, I see. But that's all I need. I go outside. Let's approach the guards. You step outside, Chex is looking around. You hear the sounds of work coming from the armorer's workshop. The woman in yellow is kneeling next to a brown hairy boar, which is resting on its side. The beast is not as large as the dark ones from the forest. Responds to the touch of the human's hands and brushes with grateful grunting and rapid twitches of its hind hoof. No matter how friendly it appears, it's still tethered to the well. You have no doubts that its charge would leave Chex dead in a breath. When the woman notices you, she steps forward to the boar's disappointment. So, the new road warden. She points at a window with her chin, forestalling the question. We don't need anything now, but when we travel with our furs, we can use some assistance. She may be around 30, but her warm voice and bright smile are camouflaging the touch of time on her unpowdered face. Like many red-haired people with freckles, her skin is unhealthily pale. The boar runs up to her, observing your boots and fruitlessly sniffing for food beneath the beaten ground. She pats it back, but maintains her focus. How about a game or two? We have a bit of time and can talk a bit about this and that. Maybe you'll get a couple of coins, or lose one. You could play dice or throw axes at a target. Uh, let's play some dice. Unfortunately, it's this is one of those where I'm going to kind of invest towards dice to see if I can... Um, because if you check the character sheet, uh, there is gambling experience down at the bottom. Help you, helps you in luck-based games of dice. I'm going to see if I can actually become like an expert gambler, because I can see that being really helpful. Your arrival, and especially the dragon bone you pull out, are cheerfully welcomed. Two of the guards bring the table from the inn, and one prepares a couple of stools and chairs. They're also spectators, and you're told that other hunters are either sleeping or have a duty in the tower. Remember, no magic, says one of the players. His face is deadly serious. The game is new to you, but in no way baffling. Four people can play at once. The wooden dice are long, with only four dotted faces. Every time someone wins a round, they get a point, and the person with the most points at the end of the game wins all the coins. As you play, you don't feel like you have much control over the results. Blend in with the group. You share casual jokes, memories, and views on luck and optimal strategies. Jax and Tulia's camp are also brought up, but when you ask about the roads or the locals, their stories are vague. The drinks are here. It's poor beer made from the leftovers, from the leftovers after the regular brewing. It's cold, sweet, and doesn't reach your head. But you try to avoid the smell. Just don't spill anything. The boar may get sick. This is the bald opponent. This is your bald op opponent. In just a few minutes, you get two points, which are now represented by small, smooth pebbles. Yeah, I'm starting to stumble over my tongue. We've been going for an hour. I'm going to clear the inn, I think. And then maybe a little bit more and then stop. I was kind of hoping to get to a, a fight just to see how those go. But I feel like this game is mostly narrative. In just a few minutes, okay, we get the pebbles. You don't really know how you got them. Either you don't like, don't get the strategy or it's just pure luck. There's a strategy to this game, I can see it. I can't be sure I'll win, but I can play better than they expect. 
After a long series of bad rolls, you finish with two points. The second lowest score, you put a dragon bone in front of the guard in yellow armor, whose comically exaggerated thanks are met with laughter. After the table and chairs are moved back, to in, moved back into the building, she asks if you need anything. I should have uh, saved and loaded. Oh well. Have you been at the heart of the wood? Ever been at the heart of the woods? We sometimes hunt south from here. They're good hunting grounds in the western half. The second one's too overgrown. Maybe the soil is different. She shrugs. Then moves the hair away from her forehead. Time is time of day is it? Oh yeah, it's still early. Uh so. The second one is too overgrown. Maybe the soil is different. She shrugs, moves the hair away from her forehead. But it's a risky spot. There are treants there and wolves, and even furless ones. If you have to go through the tall grasses, watch out for what's on the ground. There are many archers in the trees. She smiles as if it's a joke, but there are all all too many worms, either, even larger than a water leech. Tell me about yourself. What was that? After a brief giggle, her sto her voice gets stone cold and serious. I'm yeah, stumbling too much. Yeah, her voice gets cold and serious. Now, nah, Road Warden, we use names and stories among friends. You ain't one. Don't make me tempt curses. Foraging for berries at the uh foraging for berries for the innkeep. She chuckles, so I've heard, don't worry about it. Usually we forage by ourselves, but he wouldn't ask for a dragon ask you for for a dragon for a meal. He gives small jobs to people all the time, just to see who agrees to do them. He wants to judge who's of use and who's too proud for their own good. Interesting. So she doesn't trust me enough to tell me about herself. I like these. Uh, let's see. What else is there? Holy shit, there is lore. I want to talk more about this stuff. Ah, screw it. That's an unusual tower. Uh, I'd expect it to be closer to the gate and shorter. In Hovlaven? Fair. But it ain't here to protect the gate. This stronghold was built before we, bu um, before we moved in. And not to fight off humans. The tower is meant to be used by those who observe the deep, deep forest. We look out for fires, dragons, and any winged creatures that are looking to roost on the roof. Baldy, she nods towards a man who indeed is completely bald, has a great eye, and sees well in the darkness. Any interesting creatures living a bit nearby? Ha! <laughs> here? Everything lives here. She flips her hair. I swear we saw a few dragons, a unicorn family, a battle between trolls and goblins, face two beastmen, oh, and a gargoyle, and a hunting... And a hunting queen shouts all the time. I can tell you all about them, but I won't. She winks and pats the boar on his head. You know hunters have their secrets. The group seems quite attached to the boar. How could you not? She crouches and raises the boar's head. But it steps away and squeals as if someone's murdering it. It came with us from the city, just in case. We had no clue how our first winter would go. So we needed some backup meat. And it works too. Cleans the dirt. She reaches out to the beast again, but it trots away. The woman straightens up with a pleased sigh. We haven't needed to eat it so far, but it's also funny. I lean, uh, learned in the home village that the farm boars are getting a bit smaller and more cuddly, kind of like ibexes, so it's not such a wild, dangerous beast. We don't let it get too close to the other animals or children. What do you usually hunt for? Anything we can eat or sell. If there's a partridge, a squirrel, or a rat, we can't complain. But when we move as a group, we look for something larger. Deer and aurochs are delicious, but we don't always look for taste alone. There's value in bones, antlers, claws, tusks, things people use to make tools or sculptures. We use some of them to make tools or spears. We can never have enough spears. She pauses and looks at a strand of her hair, then suddenly speaks again. We look for furs, of course. What can I find north of here? Okay, sorry we don't really go to these regions. I don't know if there's anything new. Uh, never seen a beach. Okay. And I'm not going to ask about the necromancers because that'd be weird. Looking for knowledge about wild creatures. Okay. Fifteen dragons for info. Well, I think, um, questions about this place? No. I think we're, we're tapped out. Let's head to the armorer. Uh, let's see. I'm losing my voice a little bit, so I might actually just want to go th through this a bit faster. Um, let's see, how are my clothes? After a few minutes, the man finishes his task, raises his head. He puts away a piece of... Okay, I guess I should go back one, just because. You walk past the wall and find a small open shell shed. Mm, one second. 
You walk past the well and find a small open shed, not unlike the stable, but with a humble set of tables, carving tools, hammers, sharpening stones, pincers, knives, and other tools. As long as something can be solved by brute force, this place will find a way to do so. There are two people sitting on a long bench. The first is a male with maybe an inch long hair. Cleanly shaven face, a thin long yellow tunic, bare legs and sandals. He ignores your presence, sewing a gambus in with great concentration. The second is a boy, maybe 15, who's wearing the crude outfit of a farmer. He glances at you, but soon returns to sharpening a, sharpening a long dagger. Okay. After a few minutes, the man finishes his task and raises his head. He puts away the piece of piece of a garment on the table, stands up, bows to you, and shrugs, waiting for you to speak. Could you patch my clothes if they were torn? Shakes his head and points at the uneven seams of his own tunic, then grabs a crude, crude bone needle and shows you its broken head. He wouldn't even if he had the tools, says the boy. But you can try Howler's De Dell or Gale Rocks. Look at the youngster. Learning the trade, I see? Kind of. He answers reluctantly, but his teacher pats his knee, giving him a harsh look. The kid clears his throat. Yes, we both ain't masters, you see. There's not a soul to teach us, so once I'm ready, I'll try hunting instead. Fixing things for others is boring. The man grunts a sound, though you don't understand it. Seeing your face, the boy chuckles. He said safe. Let's meet in the middle. Boring, but safe. The man nods. Okay, let's see what he has. He nods and points at the laces in front of your jacket, raises his clenched fingers to his shoulders, then gently spreads and lowers them as if he's taking off his robe. You follow his commands and allow him to properly inspect your gambeson. After, your few, after a few minutes, he gives it back, then reaches for his pouch. He pulls out one dragon bone, shrugs, and another one and waves both of them in the air, pursuing his, er, pursing his lips. He makes a few speech-like noises with an em his empty mouth, groaning, what sounds like, I don't know. Consider his offer. Okay. In an hour, your jacket will be carefully patched up. Your jacket is as good as this armor can make it. Okay. I feel like the gambit could use some adjustments. Okay. I think we're good. So let's go to the well. Oh, perfect. The recently renovated water... Uh... Renovated wooden roof covers the well from the rain and birds. One of the guards is enjoying the cold drink he drew with a bucket. It tells you to use only as much water as necessary. The oak soap, uh, oak ash soap you own can help you get cleaner. So we need three pieces of bathing equipment to get more out of this place. I wash my shell. Splashing yourself with cold water from a bucket won't take away your smell, but it's enough to remove the tallow and sweat from your skin or mud stains from your clothes. Okay. And now I think it's time for me to travel again. Uh, let's see. So we can actually see various locations and what they have there. So... I don't know what time it is. Okay, so time did pass while I was doing all of this, but I think it's fine. The road uphill meanders, slowing you down and forcing you to pay close attention to not only the shadows of the trees, but also to the tight rocky passages. You can't help but notice a few caves and fine ambush spots. Keep an eye out for any sign of life. The Ruined Village. And standing in front of the gate, you hear no voices. No tools at work, no steps. Dozens of birds live among the collapsed roofs. Their fluttering, singing, and squawking is free of worries. If you want to travel any further, you need to ride around the palisade. Searching the ruins may take a lot of time. The broken gate in the north will lead you to the village. The sound of... The gentle river reaches you from the east, where you see a saggy fence surrounding an overgrown pasture. Behind the burnt building in the east, you see an oddly barren field. See the building near the field. The broken logs and planks are charred, and while the wooden walls are rotted and covered in, mo covered in moss, you see no ashes or dust, proving that the fire happened long ago. The smell is awful, there are no reasons to stay for long. You see no furniture, just some broken shelves. It was just a storage room. The valuable odds and ends were already taken by scavengers. Take a closer look at the gate. The palisade is in good is in good shape and the gate wasn't even touched by the fire. It was torn away, possibly thrown. The used force must have been huge, but you'd expect that it would push that it would push the entrance into the village, not away from it. You don't see any marks of a dragon bite. A troll could toss such planks, but after so many years you see no paw prints. A mage? You can't really tell move forward. Where do you want to go? Uh, inspect the pasture. You don't find a single sign of the livestock that lived here in the past. Any bones, horns, antlers, and dung have already been devoured by the wilderness. 
The pasture ends in a river. On the opposite bank, the meadow turns into a thick forest, impenetrable for a rider. What are the chances that a herd of defenseless animals could get there and survive? The breach in the southern fence wasn't made by some brute force. You find axe cuts, cuts in... Uh, axe cuts in the spots that were ultimately broken away. After all these years, there are no tracks that you could follow. Fields. You're surrounded by what looks like a field, plowed in late autumn, disturbed by hundreds of rains and snowfalls. There are a few clumps of grass and wheat, but a place like this one, abandoned for years, should have already turned itself into a green lee. A barren field, maybe it was overused, but you would still expect the weeds to sprout. A curse? The path leading west from here ends at the edge of the field, shifting into a meadow, then a forest. In the north, you see a path leading around the palisade. I don't have a way to investigate. You feel a slight aching in your stomach. Where do you want to go? I inspect the palisade in the west. The tracks of human footwear and many, many more ape footprints cover the path formed around the palisade's breach. As you can tell, the freshest footprints lead to the village. The wooden stakes spread on the ground... Uh, Stakes spread on the ground are rotten, covered in mushrooms, small flowers, insect, and worms. A good source of animal animal goblin food, though you'd expect them to also hunt for birds and eggs. The meadow in the for meadow in the west turns into a forest quickly. The grasses in the north are surrounded by dozens of tree stumps already covered with moss and fungi. Going south, you'll reach a large field, though you don't see any crops. Shouldn't enter the forest, especially not in this area. It's unpredictable. I'm just going to circle this whole thing. Explore the northwest part of the village. Or main square... Clearing in the west? The meadow is lush and colorful. So dense it's unsafe for a rider. For a couple of minutes you lead checks with a rope. Avoiding the potential disaster in case of... In case a hoof falls into an animal den. Being forced to travel around the palisade every time you get here is going to be a pain. Most of the tree trunks look similar and have com comparable size. They're most likely planted with the sole purpose of being cut down and used by the locals. Though cutting so many trees at once, that alone could provoke the wrath of the herds. Such a process should be spread across a couple of seasons and you can't be sure that was the case. In the west and north, the clearing turns into a wild forest. In the east, you see a road leading to the... Leading, uh, bleh, leading north. I leave the clearing. I go to the road, leading north from the village. You're at the closed northern gate. The neglected road is partially overgrown. You hear a river in the east, separated by lush meadow, filled with crickets and rodents. Take a closer look at the gate. Push or pulled, it doesn't move an inch. Someone spread dirt and rocks beneath it and around it, seemingly to keep the plank stuck in the ground. Go somewhere else. Okay. Ah, uh, you know what? Barren fields. Head to the river. You see a quenching family of boars, some of them brown, some black. You consider turning back, but they pay you little attention. After a couple of grunts, they run north. The river is not too wide, yet unusually deep, with planks altered by the locals for decades, if not centuries, or with banks, not planks. The water is cold and clean, yet filled with long plants growing from the bottom. You, you would rather avoid jumping inside or drinking from it, but you're tempted to at least wash your face, neck, and hands. Dozens, if not hundreds of small fish are looking for tasty leaves, but also try to avoid their predators, a dance of life completely unaware of your presence. You suddenly realize there's something buried among the kelp, a rusty sickle sticking out of the ground, a couple of stone axes and hoes, the wooden handles, and a large... Wagon are covered with moss, but you recognize their shapes. Why would someone drop them here? On the opposite bank, the meadow turns into a thick forest. Okay, consider washing myself in the river. Okay, but we can't get any cleaner here. Uh, let's see. I explore the northwest part of the village. The colorful grass covers the entire fence pasture. The large stone placed in the middle suggests it could be a playground for ibexes, or maybe it's just an old garden. You see a couple of small sheds, a latrine, and a single building in the south, completely burnt down. All of these places were cleaned up by scavengers. Jex doesn't want to approach the large ruins in the north. 
The terrible stench of feces and rotten food scares you off as well. The paths are covered with goblin footprints. Daytime, so the back should be asleep. If the beasts were alive, or were active, they could they would try to scare you off or hunt you down for your mount. Or hunt down your mount. This is their territory, and once they wake up, you'll face a furious enemy. I go somewhere else quietly. Main square. In every village, the main square is the fanciest area, meant to charm travelers. It, This was way more than you expected. The houses are as big as in Hovleven, and the paved ground took a lot of work and materials. The walls, now charred and riddled with holes, are made of an expensive coated wattle. The tiles for the roofs also had to be brought here from a different settlement. You peek inside the three smaller buildings, their rotting remains, or the rotting remains of their former splendor. The birds living in dozens of nests respond to your arrival with a quiet commotion. With quite a commotion. You don't even find a single dragon bone, nor tool or piece of furniture left unbroken or unrotten. It's surrounded by bad smells, dirt, animal droppings, and garbage. The well also stinks. It has no bucket, but you're afraid to use it anyway. Who knows how many birds have relieved themselves inside, or how many old rats have found their death while climbing up the walls. Suddenly you hear sounds coming from the largest building. You stop and touch your axe. I, ch I should check it out. Uh, here, let's quick save. I should check it out. I prepare my axe. You step cautiously towards the scent of urine and sweat. The flickering candle shows you broken furniture, yet no signs of burnt wood. You consider pulling the other door when a masculine voice proves that your presence is not unnoted. I don't want, didn't want to do this, but stay where you are. Whatever you put inside, be it a shoe, hand, or your damn thinker, it'll get a bolt. Relax, stranger. I'm a road warden, and you chose this place to visit from all that there are. Even outlaws don't come here. He pauses, then goes on before you respond. It may be you're telling the truth, so let's say this. My little ballista here is all pulled and ready, but you won't do anything stupid, right? No running, no jumping around? Show your hands. The man's voice lacks confidence, and his accent is tricky for you. He could be from the distant south, but as long as you don't speak too quickly, you understand one another. You don't hear any other movements, breathing voices. You lean your axe against the doorframe and make sure that your knife is well hidden. I walk inside. The dense smell of urine hits you with full force. While well, the tools and utensils are hard to distinguish from rubbish, the route to the upper floor is blocked by a collapsed roof and loose wooden beams. There are scraps of rusting iron and steel on the ground detached from the now detached from now destroyed barrels. The scavenger is sitting on a blanket in front of the tent, pointing at the floor with his loaded crossbow. Not a short man, though a bit skinny. He's tanned, dark-haired, and has seen his share of struggles. There are long claw scars on his left cheek, and another one that would divide his eyebrow in half if it hadn't been consumed by a fire, just like the rest of his forehead. His clothes are untainted by vanity. He's barefoot, in a dirty linen shirt, with rolled up sleeves and simple pants that can use a cord for a belt. His long beard and hair are untrimmed and tangled. I sit on the stairs with raised hands. I'm not a threat. You wipe the dust off of his... Oh, uh, you wipe the dust off the steps, but before you sit down, you hear the man's annoyed voice. Now don't get too homey. It's the only place here that's not just ashes and debris. I'm not sharing it. You better ride ahead. I already piled up what, whatever hasn't rotted. The candle lights are dancing on his burnt face and arms. He moves his crossbow just enough to make sure, sure he won't shoot you by accident. Saw your horse. Maybe you could help me, hmm? What are you looking for in this place? You don't sound like you're from the north. Want to make sure there are no undead crawling around. Or need to get to know the peninsula if I'm going to patrol it. Uh, short on dragon bones. What caused the place to collapse? And bandits. Looking for another road warden, a man known as Asterian. I never met him, but surely heard his name many times. He vanished long before I got to the coast. First people are asking about him, now they think he's dead. Listen, he scratches his thighs nervously. I'm hungry, so damn hungry. Can't hunt or fish with all the ape men around. Can you spare anything, roadster? I may be a drifter. Um, wouldn't, wouldn't beg if I hadn't lost my bags on the road. I bought some extra. I should be fine. Here, I have a few prunes and a sausage and some nuts. Should be enough for tomorrow as well. Ha! You say so, but you don't know, you don't know my dearth. He bites into the sausage right away. But after a couple of solid bites, he puts your gifts into an unfolded tunic that's lying on the floor. 
Without you, I would have run... Have to run after birds with my ballista. But I need to save the bolts for the ape men. Because of these stinkers, I can't roast here. And raw meat makes me want to puke. Thank you. After a moment of hesitation, he grabs one of the plums. Now, Roadster, do you have questions? Ask. I'll say a lot to make he, he get me out of here. I should ask him what he wants. Where do you want to travel to now? And what will you give me for my help? Let me explain first. I was in Howler's Dell, the closest village to the north. East and north. And people there are nice, you know. Not like an old pag Pagos. Those are all boring and grimmer than a cow, but they cry for corn, cry for, cry coin for everything, and damn good coin. I left, wanted to look around the ruins, see if there's anything left, and moved to Pelt and hired the hunters to help me here. No luck, bunch of griffs jumped my pack bird. I just bought it. He spits on the floor. Fast and nimble, but not brave enough to listen to me when all that screeching and scratching started. I ran away with my bags. Few fell on the ground and I pulled them here, but you see how it is. I won't travel around without a tent on my back, or with a tent on my back. That's his crossbow with his fingers. I need maybe a day more. Aye, just a day, and I'll have all the iron scraped from the barrels so I can move forward. But I can't take my stuff alone, and, with, and without me around, the ape men are going to break in and steal all my shit. I need to stay here. Since you have a horse, come back tomorrow and help me return to Howler's Dell. How about it? Just need to know the road is safe. Safe as can be, I mean. Uh, let's see, so what do you want me to do? Uh, let's see, I need you to make sure there's no danger hiding in the road. From here to... Uh, I f from here to Howlers, or rather, I know there's some danger, but as long as you can get me sa there and safely return, I'm sure we can handle some roaming monsters. Uh, so as long as you can get there and safely return. I see. As... the eh, words. I'm sure we can handle some roaming monsters. He theoretically... or theatrically... Theat theoretically... Rubs his hands together. This ballista's hit more bee skulls than I have fingers, and I've never lost a finger roadster. Only the toes. Made to prove it. He starts to count his, count on his fingers. If you see the road is clear, then come here tomorrow, and we'll pack my stuff on your horse and move out. But don't go come here if it's close to evening. We're going to need three hours on our feet, and I won't push through into the night. Even sleeping next to an eight-man tribe is safer. He chuckles. Don't make me, don't make me wait too long. I'll wait for a couple of days if I find some food. But if you don't get back, I'll have to risk it no matter what. Why Howler's Dell? If you want to go south, we could head to the Pelt of the North. I mean, I see your point, but I've never been there. Will they afford Will they afford my iron? Do they have how to pay for it? I need coins to find a handy bunch that will walk south with me. I need a new staff and bolts. I know the village. It's a nice place and has a smithy of sorts. I had a chance to take a look, though. It's a large inn, a safe one. They seem to be rich and have enough hunters to guide you south. You can use the iron to barter. Well, it's a shorter path, I guess. Fewer spots to get surrounded by corpses. If you're sure it's the best option, fine. I'll trust a roadster's judgment. And work for free. I have my ways to pay ye. Don't worry. I can give you dragons. But I'll have to sell the iron first, so I'll need a bit of time, you see. Five for a short escort would be plenty, I'd say. But if you want... I'll give you a secret jar of mine, very fine mixture that scares eight men away. Works on pebblers, too. When you ask if all the stench of urine is somehow related to the potion, he just winks and chuckles. Fine, it's a deal. I'm going to escort you. Thanks, Roadster. Come back tomorrow. I'll make it worth your time. Okay. I think at this point I'm going to have to stop. I've been going for quite a while and my voice is starting to go. Uh, I realize that I have done functionally very little and have mostly just read a novel to you all for this game. However, I think that's exactly what this game is, and I don't feel like this is misrepresenting what it is. I guess I could have skipped a lot of the details and lore, but at the same time, I think the details and lore are what make this game so special. Uh, I, I really like the world building, this, this kind of dour, low fantasy world with do dour, low fantasy illustrations. Pixel art, actually. It's good pixel art, too. It, it's not much, but it's enough to communicate what I'm looking at, so I don't have to just imagine it in my head. And then also the, uh, the just acoustic guitar in the background just, just kinda going. It's nice. It's a really pleasant thing. This is not the kind of game that I think I would play actively, you know? It's the kind of game that I would just load up in the evening before bed, uh, just to have 
something to do, but also to immerse myself in an interesting story and an interesting world in a way that, you know, most video games give you the option to look at something like this, but don't really let you interact. Whereas this one, it feels like, I am here, I am doing this. And there's kind of that aspect of like, I don't really know what I'm doing. I'm trying to just be my usual amiable, friendly kind of personality that I usually am. And I think it's working fine, but it feels like you could also do quite a lot of other stuff or breeze past almost all of these things if you want to. I don't know, but either way, I think it's, I think it's solid. And like I said at the beginning of the video, it's available on PC now for 11 bucks down to like nine, like nine, 989 uh, for launch week. There's also a demo. So if you guys want to try this yourselves, if I remember right, the demo is actually fairly substantial. So you should be able to get a fair distance in if you want to, if you want to play more of it uh, and like really see if it's worth your time and money. Personally, I think it's probably one of the better books I've read in a while because most books tend to be fairly high fantasy or like wish fulfillment-y. And this one very much feels like you are just some dude. You might be slightly special, but you're no hero. At least not yet. But anyway, with all of this said, uh, I guess one final thank you to Moral Anxiety and Assemble Entertainment for sponsoring this video. Very kind of you. And I had a... F ton of fun. It was a very pleasant experience. I don't know if I can call it fun in the same way that like some other games would be, but at the same time, like the craft and lore and writing and all of these bits and bobs, even just the exploring the map on the left felt good. And you know, when you start, you can only see part of the area and you really have to kind of choose what you're doing. And some part of that is, I, I don't know, just really cool to me. Uh, it is a game that is very intentional with how you engage with it. I like that. That you don't just uh, blaze through. Or maybe you could, I'm not sure. Uh, but I like that a lot. So, with all of that said, if you guys like this video in any way, shape, or form, leave me a like, helps more than you know, and if you want to see more rad new indie games every single day, then hit subscribe because I've got tons of them to check out. But for now, thank you all so much for watching, and I'll see you next time.